Hello everyone, I'm Prasoon Agrawal from EQ International Magazine and today I'm here to talk about the Japanese group Oryx Corporation's partnership with Sun Group for foray into the Indian solar market. Sun Group, a leading principal investor in emerging markets, has announced a joint venture with uh, joint venture partnership for its distributed generation focused solar business, Sun Renewables, with Oryx Corporation, which is one of the largest Japanese financial services groups and the largest solar developer in Japan. And to talk about this partnership, we have with us Mr. Uday Khemka. Uday Khemka is the Vice Chairman of Sun Group of Companies. Mr. Hidetake Takahashi. Mr. Takahashi is the Senior Managing Director at Oryx Corporation. And Mr. Pankaj Sahagal, who is the CEO of Sun Renewables. Hello everyone, sir. Thank you. So first of all, sir, I would like to begin uh, with a question to just understand this partnership between Sun Group and Oryx Corporation. So I would like to have some comments on that. Well, uh, at Sun, uh, we have, for the last two years, searched the world for the right long-term partner for what we believe to be a very exciting long-term opportunity, which is the ability to provide renewable energy-based power solutions to corporate customers across India. And we realized very early on that this business was not a business of trying to quickly create a basket of megawatts and do something with it in the capital market, but a true, real, long-term industrial power business. And for that, you needed a long-term institutional partner who would be with you 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we looked around the world, we met companies in the US, Europe and Japan and came to the conclusion that the very best partner we could hope for was the Oryx Corporation of Japan. Oryx is the uh, one of the largest diversified financial institutions in Japan. It's the leading solar developer in Japan and most importantly has a culture that we greatly respect and admire. And so we're delighted about the joint venture and believe it will be a very solid long-term foundational institutional entry point into this business. So can all of you gentlemen please describe in detail about your companies i mean your your respective companies mr mr takahashi on all corporation and sun group as a whole and mr pankaj cycle on sun renewables about the company's promoters directors and the objective objectives and its plan in the solar industry of india please so, yeah. uh, as prasan uh, mentioned that uh, oryx is the uh, one of the largest uh, financial services company and uh, we also have a uh, well diversified uh, business portfolio, in, including uh, real estate, uh, uh, clean energy, power business, and uh, uh, we started a uh, power business since uh, mid nineties. And uh, after the uh, introduction of heat and tariff in Japan, uh, uh, we aggressively uh, we have aggressively uh, involved in renewable business and. Uh, uh, we have became uh, the largest uh, solar uh, power player in Japan and uh, uh, in the meantime uh, we are also looking for the opportunity out outside of Japan and we believe that we understand that uh, India is, uh, is getting uh, uh, one of the largest uh, solar markets in the world. Mm. In the world. So uh, we have been looking for the uh, right, uh, right partner here in India and uh, uh, we finally uh, uh, identified uh, uh, Sun Group and uh, we have been discussing with uh, Sun Group for uh, one year and we conclude to, to partner with uh, them is the uh, best uh, uh, set for us. Alright, so Mr. Bekemka about the Sun Group of companies, sir. Um, Sun and the Kemka family have over a hundred years uh, developed uh, various different businesses in India uh, and in other emerging and developing countries like Russia and Kazakhstan and Africa and probably I won't spend the time on all that history. Today we are involved in oil and gas, mining, uh, real estate, aerospace, electronics and now uh, a, a, tr a great focus on uh, what we call new energy and new energy includes uh, we have a flagship company called Sun New Energy Holdings that includes renewable energy, uh, electric battery storage, and electric mobility. Renewable energy is the core of this, and we have been 
uh, involved in looking at renewable energy and investing in it for many years. Um, we have projects that are envi- involved in, uh, in one way or the other in recycling or extended life in the rubber sector. We have hydro dam projects. Uh, we've invested in solar in other markets and we've been looking at this market for a long time. Uh, we are absolutely convinced that the distributed solar sector is really the most exciting long-term opportunity if you have a long-term mindset and uh, and that's why uh, this for us will become uh, a really a flagship project and we're very excited about it. Sure. Uh, Mr. Pankaj Saigal about Sun Renewables specifically and uh, I would also like to add one more question to it. What what, what are your future plans uh, now with the partnership with Oryx Corporation? How are you going to take this ahead? Yeah, good morning, uh, Prasun. Uh, well, so Sun Renewables is a joint venture between Oryx and Sun, as you said. Mm-hmm. The focus is on distributed solar, uh, focusing on CNI customers as well as government uh, projects. And our aspiration is to be the number one leading player in the country. Okay, that's great. So, uh, Mr. Seigal, I would also like to have your comments on the, uh, I mean, what what brings you to the distributed solar um, sector in India? I mean, what is the untapped solar opportunity in India which we are looking to to capture in the coming years? Well, uh, if you look at the uh, power situation in the country, there is a massive power deficit. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we feel the distributed solar or distributed power in general mm-hmm. uh, is ideally suited because the power generation is happening at the point of consumption right. and hence there is no transmission distribution losses. <coughs> exactly. And that's the primary thesis uh, of, uh, of uh, distributed energy. In case of distributed solar, the price points and the pure economics uh, is very compelling. Uh, distributed solar today at a retail point for the consumers which may be commercial or industrial is cheaper than the great power mm-hmm. and that is the most uh, most uh, uh, compelling aspect of distributed solar for us besides of course it's clean it's climate friendly right. uh, and it's very easy to install compared to other forms of energy mm-hmm. and uh, um on the distributed solar market of India, the government of India has also set a target of 40 gigawatt of rooftop solar, only rooftop solar out of the 100 gigawatt target of, of the uh, overall solar power capacity by 2022. So do you think the industry has the potential and the industry has the, uh, the momentum to achieve this target by the set timeline? Well, certainly the um, the potential is obviously there in a country like India. Right. Uh, by 2022 or a few years later, mm-hmm. uh, maybe uh, another matter. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, 2022 is just you know one of the years uh, that the government has picked uh, because of the scale of solar, uh, which is relatively small. Um, and uh, it, it takes a, a while, there's a typical J curve, uh, like in any new industry uh, which is being set up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whether it's by 2022 or a few years down the line, but we are absolutely confident that uh, we will not only meet the 40 gigawatt but exceed it mm-hmm. over time. Now whether that happens by 25 or 30 mm-hmm. is not clear, mm-hmm. but what is very clear is the economics of distributed solar mm-hmm. is overwhelming. And the need for a country like India, where you have 350 million people without grid access, uh, you would see a same transformation happening in distributed solar Mm -hmm. that we have witnessed in mobile phones, for example, Mm -hmm. with over a billion phones now. Mm -hmm. Same thing we expect that most of the routes in the country over the next decade will have solar on them. So... um on that point, sir, I would also like to have your comments on on the on the uh, we can say the significance of energy storage. How energy storage is going to shape that uh, uh, the the access to uh, electricity to the people who don't have grid access. So how important energy storage is going to be in that uh, domain? So yeah, when you have power which is in firm. Uh, especially in case of solar where you're producing the power during daytime mm-hmm. and generally the need is much more during the evening or night right. uh, storage per force is an important component 
of your power equation. Obviously, as we all understand, while solar prices have come down to below what is called grid parity, when you add the storage cost, it's still far more expensive than the grid power. Mm -hmm. However, when you look in the context of India, where there is a great dependence on uh, diesel power, and you combine solar plus storage today, it's still quite economical compared to <coughs> diesel mm -hmm. power. So there are applications we would argue today as well, uh, where you could use storage uh, and be uh, economically viable. But going forward, uh, storage is seeing the same or a similar cost decline that we have seen over the last five years in solar. solar right. So our perspective is by 2022, you should see what is called grid independence for solar plus storage. I don't know, Mr. Kim or Takashi San would have points. I would just add a couple of points on the two uh, questions you've asked and hand to Takahashi San. Mm -hmm. uh, on the first, um, I chaired an organization called the Solar Policy Rooftop Coalition um, under the ambit of our foundation and a number of other institutions, including the British government and others. I think it's the climate group, I guess. And the climate group was involved with that. And we presented a report to the government of India. That report argued that the, in terms of your question around the 40 gigawatt target, mm -hmm. that we would achieve if there were no improvements to the policy framework, sort of 12 to 15 gigawatts in the ordinary organic course okay. by that target. Mm -hmm. If the policy prescriptions that we had recommended, mm -hmm. we argued that um, we would achieve 28 gigawatts or so by 2022. Um, if we would wait another few years, two, three, four years, we would achieve the 40 gigawatt target on that basis. If, however, the government wanted to achieve the originally designated 40 gigawatts mm -hmm. by 2022, then the delta, the increase between 28 and 40 would require subsidy. Okay. So that was the analytical framework we put out. And nothing in the last year has, I was talking uh, to some of our partners um, since we gave that report, and the feeling is, if anything, we have more confidence in the trajectory today than we did when we gave the report mm -hmm. by a few megawatts. So I think that's roughly our sense of the market, quantitatively mm -hmm. speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, and with respect to um, solar plus storage, which was your second question, I think this is the most exciting thing. Okay. One, thing because, one thing I would like to add sure. on, on, on the previous question itself, what is the present status as of today on the on the policy initiatives which you, uh, uh, along with your team, had suggested? So, what is so the there are status? there are many Have there many of changes? those many of those are being adopted. Okay. And uh, I can't give you the precise state and the precise policy at the second, but mm. there has been a responsiveness. Okay. Trying yeah. to, yeah. but our as business people, we are conservative, so we're still planning on the lower volume number as being achieved. Right. As policy advisors, we are aggressive. We want the government to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And the government is very open to doing this. Really, one of the most remarkable things about this federal government is the degree of its responsiveness and progressiveness. It right. creates a very exciting atmosphere for business people like us. <coughs> right. On the second question, energy storage, yes. on the integration, obviously, when we talk about energy storage, we could mean it with respect to grid stabilization, or we could mean it at the DG point. So I'm assuming your question is in relation to the DG point stabilization. It's very exciting because it really enables um, firm power as opposed to intermittent and infirm power um, for corporate customers uh, in a way that they are totally independent of the grid. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean the grid's not important. The grid's very important, and we must be thinking about including discounts in our thinking about the future because energy will be generated on surplus and on deficit at various points of the day and the grid will become a traffic cop helping electrons flow in multiple directions it's not going to be an easy transition right. but it's a huge opportunity for the <coughs> discoms as well but um, at the moment it's not economical mm -hmm. to combine uh, storage Good. and uh, a rooftop Good. to totally substitute for firm energy but in as what 
uh, Pankaj said, I think it's only single digit years away mm -hmm. because the costs of storage are falling every year in a, in a trend that resembles what happened to solar panels. Right. Pakistan, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah. to meet the uh, target of uh, 100 gigawatt by mm -hmm. uh, 2022 is, uh, I think, generally a very challenging uh, target, but uh, it might be achievable because uh, the government policy is uh, very positive and uh, uh, many players is uh, entering into the market but uh, for achieving this uh, uh, formidable uh, uh, target uh, I think uh, the key thing is how to bring the uh, international capital into the uh, uh, solar uh, market here in, mm -hmm. here in India. <coughs> For that, I think uh, the market uh, need to keep a uh, reasonable return in, in, in any case. And uh, uh, we have to uh, standardize, standardize the uh, uh, key contract like a PPA or a EPC or O1DEM and, them mm -hmm. and uh, uh, project finance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, com coming on the financing side, which you mentioned, so I would also like to ask you, Mr. Takahashi, what are the major financing challenges which, which foreign financiers majorly are facing while, while venturing into the Indian solar sector? I mean, related to PPAs, land, land acquisition, grid integration, what are the kind of challenges they are facing majorly? Yeah, land acquisition is one of the uh, challenging things here in India. And uh, other things is the uh, uh, currency risk. Mm -hmm. uh, if we think about uh, uh, current uh, rate of return uh, level, mm -hmm. uh, it might be challenging for uh, foreign investor to take uh, another uh, rupee, rupee uh, currency risk mm -hmm. um, ba based on the current uh, uh, in IRR. Mm. Okay. And talking about Oryx Corporation, uh, what are some of the other noteworthy projects in the uh, renewable energy sector which you have done recently, be it in India or outside India? Can you yeah, in India last year, uh, we invested in 1,000 for uh, megawatt uh, wind, uh, wind portfolio okay. uh, together with IR and FS. Mm -hmm. And outside of Japan, uh, outside of India, uh, we are aggressively invested in, and, and uh, uh, we just invested in uh, one gigawatt uh, IPP as uh, solar IPP operator in uh, in uh, China, mm -hmm. and we also invested in hydro IPP operator in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. mm. Something like that. Uh, we are very aggressively uh, globally. Mm. Okay. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask Mr. Khenga or Mr. Pankaj Saigal, who, whoever can answer this question. I mean, we have recently seen um, developers giving means ultra low bids for their projects. I mean, it is it is hurting the EPC people, it is hurting the financiers, it is hurting the the the, 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 the lower end of the of the of the of the of the industry. So, how are you people going to uh, compete with that? What what is your strategy to 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 come up with that? So uh, let me address that in two parts. The first part is with respect to utility scale ground mount. Yeah. And then I'll return to solar rooftop and corporate CNI. Um, you must understand that the goal of the Indian federal government has been dramatically to reduce prices. So the reduction of prices that has occurred is seen as a success by the Indian state. In order to achieve this um, attempt to converge the cost of solar production with the cost of coal production, as you know, the government has gone out of its way to make so the solar industry very easy, very simple, by creating major solar parks where power evacuation is organized for you, by creating a transparent bidding system, uh, where people can feel confident that the bids are completely competitive um, and various other features. As a result, large-scale utility, uh, large utility-scale ground mount projects are very easy to execute in India and it's become totally commoditized. And that is natural, therefore, that prices, uh, tariffs should have come down. Mm. At the same time, we're all aware of the 85% collapse in Chinese module prices that has converged with this trend. Right. So there has been a dramatic collapse of uh, tariffs in the ground mount sector that we've all witnessed. This collapse, however, does not mean that what is happening today is totally irrational. 
um, a detailed deconstruction of IRRs for developers who have become very sophisticated in how they vendor finance, how they refinance, how they use single trackers, indicates that at least for rupee, rupee investors, the returns are reasonable, even today. However, the problem arises for international investors who have to bake in dollar devaluation. And there, I would note that there are some international investors who are not dollarized and who have volatile currencies and are willing to take Indian rupee risk. And for them, it makes more sense. Finally, uh, a currency itself depends upon your view of macroeconomics of a country. And there are people who feel that Modi's India will not necessarily follow the projective trajectory of the past and that the currency, as has recently happened, will strengthen. So they can make bets. But I should say that the difficulty of this type of industry is you are making some forward-looking bets on module prices, on interest rates domestically, and on currency that mean you're doing something other than just betting on the excellence of your power execution, your project management, and so forth. This is much less the case in industrial power and CNI power. In CNI power, the core issue is the, the saving for the customer against the grid. Mm -hmm. And that is the driving consideration for the CNI customer. That's not to say competitive dynamics don't matter. Of course they do. That's not to say they may not be the occasional irrational bid. They can be. We have seen in India over the years, in every sector, a moment of irrationality. When a lot of people jump into something, mm -hmm. they mess it up for a while. And then there's a cleaning out and only serious players are left behind. Not just business, even in politics. <laughs> and our goal at Sun Renewables in our partnership with Oryx is philosophically completely different. We see this as a 20-year opportunity to fundamentally transform India's corporate and industrial energy sector. And so we will ride those waves. We will be more conservative when bids are irrational. We will be more aggressive when bids are, um, when people are feeling depressed. Mm -hmm. um, but we are profoundly clear that uh, the CNI market mm -hmm. will be driven by market-driven forces and not by the signaling effect of large-scale volumes that has driven the ground one market. Okay. And we expect it to be a lot more rational. Okay. Uh, coming on the financing requirements, which will be required uh, for this achievement of uh, of the of the we can say ultra ambitious 100 gigawatt solar target and this simultaneous 75 gigawatt wind energy target. So what are your comments on that? What 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 sort of financing requirements would the industry yeah. need? Well, I've had the privilege of being the chairman of the Clean Energy Finance Forum, which the government of India and the government of the US set up to look at this question. Um, and I'm confident that India will be able to raise the money that she needs to achieve these targets. Mm -hmm. Capacity, I'm confident India will succeed in raising the capital that's required. But you have to think of it almost like a pyramid. The foundation has to be strong. And the foundation is the contractual risk architecture, the solvency and credibility of the off-takers, the nature of the contracts and so forth. And a huge amount of work has been done in this area. That work is not complete with respect, for example, to the credit worthiness of certain discoms. That work is not complete with respect to PPA risk architecture, but a huge amount has been done. Or, for example, on the PPA uh, framework, and new guidelines will be being issued quite shortly that will have addressed many, many concerns. At the CEFF, we engage with 110 financial institutions around the world to provide the government with feedback on this issue. And many of those have been adopted. I was told recently that in the very successful MP Rewa bid, one of the reasons why the price was so low is because they had adopted many of our recommendations. Okay. So things are being very progressive in India. There's still one or two issues we're discussing with the government, but I'm optimistic we'll get there. With respect to uh, DG Solar, 
the, the counterparty is often a very creditworthy multinational, so the issues are different. Um, and the set of issues on financing are more about how you create aggregation structures to make it efficient for banks to be able to finance multiple small projects. And uh, many of us have a financial industries background. Oryx is one of the great financial institutions of Japan. And to some group, we also, many of us, have strong financial industry expertise. And so we've come together to suggest to the banks a series of mechanisms to allow aggregated finance to scale up this sector and ex are excited about those institutional approaches that may be different to a purely transactional approach of trying to get debt for individual projects. Right. I mean, this also brings me to the another question on the developer's health. Whenever a, a company, whenever a project is being financed, so there's also a question in the mind of the financiers about the developer's health. I mean, recently we have seen bankruptcies being filed by Sun Edison. I mean, Sun Edison, mm. the, the, we can say, pioneer of the solar yeah. energy solar sector in the in the in the world so what it's what 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 is the impact of such kind of uh, of events on the on the financing of solar projects in india i'd like to make three to three points on that and then i'd like my colleagues to be asked some questions too but in these this is a very crucial point and i think there are two um problems and opportunities that arise from it problems are that many of the solar players who've entered the solar industry have been driven by capital markets considerations. Um, so for example, in the case of one of the companies you cited, um, they had created a growth yield model that need to be uh, fed with increasing volumes of projects. And that created, if you like, its own incentives to feed a yield structure with more and more product. And, and, the, and, the, and what was driving the business was not a long-term industrial type of an approach, but more a capital markets compression type of an approach. And this totally changes the incentives on how you think about the development of an industry. So that's on the one side. On the other side, in the business we're excited about, that is to say, um, this small scale ground mount, uh, wheeling power, rooftop power, we find that the players in the market are small players and startup players and players that have been set up by very intelligent, bright, young teams. Um, but at the end of the day for multinationals with long-term PPAs that can last 10, 15 years, <clears throat> they want to know that you're still around and you are around uh, to service any problems that might occur, uh, that you are around to help them um, restructure arrangements and for that we were determined to find an institution that had a very long-term vision. And I'm sure you all understand Japanese culture mm. is very long-term and, and uh, Oryx Corporation is one of the leaders in the country. We also are a hundred-year-old group in India. So therefore, um, we think that that long-term approach, as opposed to a flipping short-term financial markets driven approach, applies very well for the commercial and industrial segment whatever may be the case for the utility scale ground mount segment. Right. You're building a customer trust, brand, customer service with a 20, 30, 40 year vision. And that's really the philosophy that we came together and shared and that excites us about our partnership. Right. Uh, one last question I would like to post it to uh, Mr. Pankaj Sahagal. So what's going to be the business model of, of Sun Renewables in the coming years? I and mean, uh, what are your thoughts on the on the on the significance of CAPEX or OPEX? Who is the uh, we can say the the, the, the ruler in, in, in the distributed generation market of India? Well, uh, solar uh, in general, as you know, overwhelmingly is CAPEX oriented business. The operating costs are fairly minimal. Uh, in fact, less than 5% of the total cost is in operating uh, expenses. Um, well, uh, as Uday-san and uh, Takahashi-san have been talking about, I think the fundamental uh, uh, aspects of any business, not just solar, remain the same, uh, which is you need to have a long-term mindset. Uh, you know, nothing happens overnight. Um, solar industry in India, it seems, 
because of the 15 gigawatt that has been installed uh, seems like longer than it has been. It's been only six, seven years since the, uh, so the industry is still in its infancy. I think the, 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 the truth uh, for any business model to be successful is the sustainability aspect of it. Any business in the world, the value of the business is based on the cash flows and the length of the cash flows, right? So you really have to look from that standpoint, which is sustainability uh, in terms of your quality in terms of the confidence you imbue in your customers, the quality of counterparties and the customers you choose. So it may take you a bit longer in terms of ramping up the megawatts, but this is inherently uh, a two to three decade kind of business. When you sign the PPAs with your customers, you're signing PPAs for 20 years, 25 years. So if you like, take that kind of mindset and you know focus on recruiting the best, and focusing on high quality customers, providing high quality solutions. Uh, I think that this is basic fundamental of any business, not just solar. And I think at least that's our, our focus. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Kim Kaur. It is part of uh, infrastructure or utility business. It's not uh, developing and flipping like uh, mm -hmm. real estate business. So uh, we have to have some mm -hmm. long term view as uh, Pankaj said. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, if so, uh, the uh, the cash flow nature is not so correlated correlated cor correlate to the uh, economic cycle. So mm -hmm. that can that we we can get you know a sustainable long term reasonable return from right. the uh, uh, business. I think. If you meant the capex versus opex in the uh, in the solar language which means is someone going to invest their own capital or is allow somebody else to install the equipment and sell it? Is that the question yeah, you meant? Yeah, of course. Then I think it depends upon mm -hmm. segments. So okay. I think for the retail segment, uh, you may find that it emerges as a, um, as a CapEx business. That is to say that it's bundled into your HDFC mortgage mm -hmm. to the homeowner. So they just put their own money in. Okay. But I think at the institutional level, increasingly, for sophisticated institutions, there is an understanding that you don't do your catering yourself. A catering company does it for you. Mm -hmm. You don't do your logistics yourself. A, a logistics company does it for you. In the same sense, the energy will be provided by a separate company. Okay. You won't be doing it yourself. You'll be focusing on your core business. So at the sophisticated end of the market that we're dealing with, we believe very strongly that the utility model makes sense okay. as opposed to the self-investment model. Mm -hmm. Now that may vary. Some of the PC, PSUs may want to use excess cash flows to invest in themselves. Right. Um, you know, if you're uh, one of the big oil companies, you may say, why don't I just do this myself? So it's situational. But over the years, I think more and more and more will be a customer wanting to pay for electrons and not pay for machines. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, sir. So that was a very nice opportunity speaking with you, gentlemen. And my many congratulations to your new uh, to, to your new venture. And I wish you good luck for your future. And I look forward to many such candid conversations in the future. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much. Mr. Takahashi, Mr. Kemka, Mr. Cycle. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much.